first thing when you meditate is to get your body in position. Try to sit comfortably straight in a way that feels balanced. Face forward, close your eyes, place your hands in your lap. That's the body in position. The next step is to get the mind in position. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. Notice where you feel the breathing. When we talk about breath here, we're talking about the flow of energy in the body that allows the air to come in and out of the lungs, and actually exists on many more subtle levels in the body too. But focus on the breath that's obvious to you. And notice where that movement is most obvious. And then notice if it's comfortable. If it's not comfortable, you can change. Longer breathing, shorter breathing, faster, slower. Try to see what feels right right now. That's getting the mind into position. Now, getting the body and mind into position are not hard. The hard part is keeping them there. In other words, sticking with your meditation posture. You don't want to move unless you really have to. If you find that there's a pain that comes up and it gets so bad that you can't focus on the breath, give yourself a few minutes and then change position. Don't change right away. Then as for the mind in position, you'll notice that it starts wandering off. I'll just keep bringing it back. Actually, you don't have to pull it back. If it wanders off after a thought, just drop the thought and you'll find yourself right back here. Because the breath is the closest thing there is to the mind. Your sense of the body comes through the breath. Your sense of the world around you is possible because of the breath. So when you drop thoughts, drop distractions, the mind just gravitates back. It'll come back even more quickly if you make up your mind that each time you've wandered off and you come back, reward yourself with a really comfortable breath. And then once you've rewarded yourself with one comfortable breath, well, try two, three, four. You may notice that the needs of the body change, so try to be on top of that as well. As you do this, you want to bring four qualities to what you're doing to make the meditation successful. Sometimes you hear that there is no such thing as a good or a bad meditation. But that's not really true. Sometimes the mind settles down well, and sometimes it doesn't. When it's settling down well, that counts as a good meditation. When it doesn't, it gives you work to do. Don't give up. That's a sign that there's more to learn about the mind about its ins and outs and ways to get it to settle down. So when the meditation is not going well, don't give up. Just take it as a challenge. See what you could do to make it better. And to make it better, these four qualities come in really handy. The first one is desire. This may sound strange because we've all heard that the Buddha said desire is the cause of suffering. But he was very specific about which kinds of desire cause suffering. He said there are other kinds of desire that actually are part of the path to the end of suffering, the desire to do something skillfully. If you see something unskillful arising in the mind, you try to cultivate the desire to get rid of it, and then you try to cultivate the desire to keep it from coming back. These are all desires that keep you on the path. This is one of the reasons why we have those chants right before the meditation. Some of them try to spark desire by thinking about the negative things that come when you don't meditate. You look at the world, as that chant said, the world is swept away. A lot of the things we depend on for our happiness can get wiped out so easily. When you think about that, you realize you've got to look for something more lasting in order to protect the mind. The world offers no shelter. 
In other words, when you have a disease and are suffering from pain, nobody else can come in and say, well, I'll take part of that pain away so you don't have to experience it. Your pain is your pain. So the mind needs some shelter here. You provide it with a meditation. The world has nothing of its own. All the things that you think are you or yours, at some point, are going to have to leave you. What are you going to do then? Well, if you have a good, solid state of concentration, if you have a good, well-developed discernment, you wouldn't be taken apart by the fact that these things leave. So those are some of the negative contemplations. The positive ones are to remind yourself, I, you really do want to be happy. And you want a happiness that doesn't harm anybody else. You want a happiness that allows all beings to be happy. Well, there are very few ways in the world to create that kind of happiness, but meditation is one of them. So you try to think in these ways to give yourself the desire to stick with the practice. When it's easy, you stick with it. When it's hard, you stick with it. This is the next step, which is effort, energy, persistence. The desire fires you up. As long as you don't qu quite yet see the results of the meditation, the desire has to keep you going. When you begin to see the results, then the effort becomes a lot easier. Yes. You see, the mind really does gain a greater sense of stability if it can learn how to stay with one object and let go of everything else that comes up. And if you find yourself frustrated by the fact that the mind keeps wandering off, well, try to make a game of it. In other words, see how many breaths you can stay this time. And whoop, if you slip, okay, see how many you can stay this time. Try not to get discouraged. Just keep coming back, coming back. The third quality is that you try to bring some careful attention to this. In other words, you really pay careful attention to what the mind is doing. Be intent on what you're doing. Try to notice if the mind's going to slip off, what warning signs do you have? Because all too often we're with the breath and suddenly we're off someplace else and don't know what happened. Or bring yourself back. Make up your mind, okay, the next time you're going to slip off, try to notice what are the warning signs that tell you ahead of time. The mind starts waving around, thinking about something else, trying to find something else to think about. Then it latches onto something and it has a way of hoodwinking you so you don't notice it. So be on the lookout for that. And as soon as you sense that the mind is getting a little bit wobbly in its concentration. Take a really deep breath. Think of the breath energy going throughout the whole body to parts that it normally doesn't go. Anything to firm up your intention to stay here. And the fourth quality is using your powers of discrimination. Discrimination in the good sense, in other words, figuring out what's going well, what's not going well, and then analyzing it. When it's not going well, why? This is where you bring your questioning to the practice. If the mind isn't settling down with the breath, is the problem with the mind or is it with the breath? Try experimenting with different ways of breathing to see if that's the problem, and if that doesn't seem to have any effect, then turn around and look at the mind. What attitude are you bringing here? What leftover emotions from the day are still hanging on? This is where you can bring other meditation topics in to help. If you find that you're angry at somebody, think thoughts of goodwill, like we thought just now. May I be happy. May all beings be happy. May that person be happy. And if your mind rebels, Ask it why. Why would you not want that person to be happy? And you can think about all the horrible things that person did. But then you ask yourself further, what does it mean to be happy? How does it happen? True happiness comes from causes. P 
people understand. You act in this way and happiness comes as a result. You act in that way and you're going to create misery. So when you're wishing for other people to be happy, you're wishing for them to understand the true causes for happiness and you're wishing for them to be able to act on them. Now the world would be a much better place if everybody could do that. In other words, you're not wishing, well, may this person be happy even though he's doing all these horrible things. No, that's not what we're wishing. May this person see all these things are horrible. Nobody benefits from them. In other words, you're wishing for that person to change his or her ways. That's a thought you can think about everybody. It helps get over any sense of animosity you might feel. Once you've been able to think that through, then you come back to the breath. And if you find that you're being distracted by thoughts of sensual desire, you can ask yourself, how much real pleasure, how much real deep happiness do you get out of that particular desire? Have you never had it in the past? And John Fuhrman once noted that the sensual desires that we really are thirsty for are the things we've had in the past, and we miss them. And if you think about that for a bit, you realize, well, even if you get it again, it'll leave you again, and you miss it again. Where are the pleasures of last week? They're gone. And you think of all the work you do and all the things you have to arrange to get happiness just, and just right, to get your pleasures just right. Is it really worth the effort? When you think about it, do you realize oh, it's not really worth that? I've got something better here inside, a sense of well-being that can come just by sitting here breathing. And that kind of thinking brings you back to the breath. So these are the four qualities that, as the Buddha said, bring success in the meditation. You cultivate the desire to meditate. You are persistent. You try to be really intent on what you're doing, paying careful attention to what you're doing and the results you're getting. And you try to be discriminating. And Figure out what's the best way to breathe right now, what's the best way to focus, what's the best way to deal with problems in the mind as they come up. When you bring these qualities in the meditation, it becomes a skill. And that's the whole message of the Buddhist teachings, is that happiness is not just a random event. It comes from causes particularly comes from training the mind. And you should get more and more skillful in training your mind so that it'll think the thoughts you want to th it to think, and when it starts thinking about something you don't want it to think about, you can drop the thoughts. And that your sense of what really is and is not worth thinking about will get more and more refined. So that this mind, which when it's untrained is like a wild animal in the house, can tear things up, has no sense of what's valuable, what's not valuable, what's clean and what's dirty. You train that animal, so you actually put it to work. So that desire we had for happiness, may I be happy, may all beings be happy. Begins to bear fruit as we meditate and train the mind with more and more skill.